Okay, well, thank you all for coming today, and thank you to Sierra for inviting me. Um, I'm always grateful for an opportunity to spread the word about PrEP. Um, so today I'll be talking about PrEP, or HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis, um, which is emerged as a promising new biomedical prevention strategy for people who are at high risk of acquiring HIV. Um, despite its promise, it's not as widely known as it should be. Um, it's not as widely talked about as I believe that it should be. And among those who do know of it and do talk about it, it's not universally accepted. Mixed reactions have been voiced not only by society at large, but within the healthcare community in particular. And importantly, PrEP is only as promising as it is accessible um, to the diversity of people who stand to benefit from it. Um, right now, um, because a prescription is required in order to access PrEP, healthcare providers really function as gatekeepers to PrEP. Um, therefore, if we want PrEP to be a strategy that people are able to access, it's important that we identify and address the perceived concerns and barriers that healthcare providers um, voice. And in addition to recognizing the barriers that uh, healthcare providers are aware of and have focalized, I think it's also important to think about other barriers um, that healthcare providers may not be as conscious of, things like bias and uh, prejudice. So today I'll be uh, starting out by giving you basic background information about PrEP, um, things like what it is, um, how and wh how well it works, uh, why we need it, and what some of the community reactions are to it. Um, I'm sure some of you are very well informed about PrEP. Some of you have probably never heard of it until today, so I just want to make sure we're all on the same page in terms of basic background. I'll then get into prescription guidelines um, from the CDC and barriers uh, to PrEP prescription that have been uh, voiced by healthcare providers. And lastly, um, I'd like to extend the conversation to stereotypes and the potential for discrimination in the prescription of PrEP. Um, outlining reasons why PrEP might be especially vulnerable to discriminatory prescription practices, um, discussing why this is a particular concern given the sociodemographic distribution of HIV in this country, and also providing preliminary evidence based on my research here at Yale. Okay, so PrEP refers to HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis. Um, it can be thought of as HIV prevention pills. Um, it's an antiretroviral medication. In fact, it's the same medication that's used to treat HIV among people who are HIV positive. Um, instead, it's been being used preventatively among people who are HIV negative. Um, well, there are various dosing schedules and forms of PrEP that are currently um, under development and being tested. Um, things like PrEP injections or uh, dosing um, on a monthly or um, as needed basis as opposed to on a daily basis. Um, right now, what we know is that the once a day pill form has uh, shown promise in clinical trials. Um, in particular, tenofovir uh, disoproxyl fumarate. Um, this is abbreviated as TDF, um, also known as Viriad, and I will be using the abbreviations or, or uh, brand names moving forward. Um, that medication and also tenofovir disoproxyl fumarate um, with emtricitabine, um, also known as Truvada, those two pills in particular have shown promise in clinical trials. Uh, so in July of 2012, the US FDA approved um, Truvada for prescription as PrEP um, for people who are at high risk of HIV acquisition. So you may be wondering how PrEP actually works. Um, essentially, it interferes with the ability of the HIV viral particles to replicate once they're inside uh, a person's body. So this diagram here uh, shows the process by which HIV replication would typically occur. Uh, so the large purple structure, oops, uh, the large purple structure at the bottom, it represents a CD4 cell. And then we can see here uh, the HIV virus, which is represented by uh, the green circle with purple spots on it. Now, normally, um, without PrEP, the HIV particle would bind uh, to the uh, cell membrane, as you can see through uh, numbers one through three. And once that binding occurs, it fuses with the cell membrane and the viral particle releases material 
into the CD4 cell, including its genetic material. Um, at that point, um, if we're at step four now, um, at that point, there are special enzymes or a particular enzyme called uh, reverse transcriptase, and it changes the genetic material into a form that can then be integrated into the host cell's DNA. Um, so that allows uh, the um, cell to, or the uh, new viral RNA and new viral proteins to form. They're then moving to the surface of the cell and um, released as new viral particles. So that's the normal process. Now, the currently available form of PrEP, um, Truvada, is what is called a reverse transcriptase inhibitor. So therefore, it works by inhibiting the reverse transcriptase, which interferes with the virus's ability um, to um, have its genetic material transformed into a form that can be integrated into the host cell's DNA. Mm -hmm. So that's a lot of biology, but I just kind of wanted to give you um, a little bit of the basics about why it is that PrEP works or how it is that PrEP works. Um, so you might also be wondering how well PrEP works. Um, the evidence that we have for PrEP's potential comes from double-blind, placebo-controlled clinical trials. Uh, so for those of you who are unfamiliar with this methodology, um, essentially, participants were randomly assigned uh, to either a PrEP group or a placebo group. Um, and the term double-blind means that both the um, participants and the research staff that they interacted with, the clinical staff, were unaware of the condition um, they were assigned to. So um, participants received either PrEP or a placebo uh, to take daily in pill form, and they were monitored on a monthly basis over time. So over the course of the trial, some participants in both groups became infected, and the overall efficacy of PrEP in a given study was calculated by looking at incidence of, the, of HIV in the placebo group um, as compared to the control group with higher efficacy, uh, indicating greater relative reduction in incidence. Uh, Follow-up analyses with a subset of the treatment group looked at drug concentration levels within the blood. Um, so the relative incidence of seroconversion among those with detectable levels of drug versus undetectable were then used to estimate risk reduction among people um, with detectable levels, which is thought to represent people who were adherent. Okay, so I'm going to go through the four trials that have shown promise. Uh, the first was the IPREX, trom or IPREX trial. Um, so this focused on um, MSM and trans women who had sex with men. So essentially people who were born biologically male and had sex with men. Um, they had to meet certain risk criteria. Um, this one looked at Truvada in particular, um, followed the patients for an average of 1.2 years. Um, and overall, according to the patient self-report, as well as pill counts and um, measures of medication dispensation, um, adherence was quite good. Uh, when you look at the drug concentration levels, it was less strong. Um, overall, they calculated a 44% 40%, efficacy, and um, when they looked at um, adjusting for blood concentration levels, they estimated the risk reduction uh, to be 92%. Uh, so the next trial, um, which first announced its findings in July of 2011, um, provided um, evidence that PrEP has promise for heterosexual individuals as well. Um, so this uh, took place in Botswana, um, as you can see with the map. And um, again, it was uh, Truvada that they were looking at, and they determined a 62% efficacy overall. I won't give as many details for each trial as I did in the original. Uh, so around the same time as the TDF2 results were announced, the Partners PrEP study results were also announced. So the Partners PrEP trial also looked at heterosexual adults. Specifically, it was looking at couples who were serodiscordant, which means couples in which um, one partner was HIV positive and one partner was HIV negative. Um, and here they looked at uh, not just uh, Truvada, but also TDF alone or Viriad alone. And what they found was for Truvada, there was a 75% um, efficacy overall, 90% estimated risk reduction based on um, blood detection. And when they looked at TDF alone, it was a 67% efficacy or 86% estimated risk reduction uh, based on blood detection. 
And the last one that I wanted to touch on is the Bangkok Tenofovir trial. Um, this is the one um, where results were released m most recently. Um, and this was among men and women who inject drugs. Um, they looked only at uh, TDF and found a 49% efficacy. Um, and that number was um, increased to 70% when they were looking at um, blood levels. Okay, so um, here's a graph that summarizes the efficacies that I just mentioned. Um, so along the left, you can see that I've listed the high-risk populations um, that the various clinical trials have focused on. Um, and they're in the order that I just discussed them in. Um, the light orange bars represent um, tenofovir or TDF alone, and the dark orange bars uh, represent tenofovir with emtricitabine um, or uh, Truvada. And um, so you can see that the efficacy results look promising, and I think it's important to remember that this is overall for the sample, and it's quite higher um, when looking at blood detection. Okay, so now that you have evidence for PrEP, you might be wondering why we need PrEP. Um, simply put, because HIV continues to spread. Um, over 30 years into the U.S. epidemic, we still have about 50,000 people becoming infected every year. We really don't have a sil silver bullet for prevention. We have a lot of great prevention options, but no perfect solution. Um, we know that abstinence works, but we know that abstinence isn't for everyone. In fact, it's not for a lot of people. Uh, we know that condoms work if used correctly and consistently, um, but a lot of people don't use condoms consistently and correctly. Um, you can stay in a monogamous partnership with someone who is tested negative, um, and that in theory works, but not everybody chooses to be in a monogamous partnership, and not everybody's partner chooses to be monogamous. Um, treatment as prevention is another method of prevention that um, has been kind of an exciting development in the past couple of years. And this is when within a partnership where one person is HIV negative and the other is HIV positive, um, the HIV positive person uh, takes antiretroviral medication to suppress his or her viral load and therefore is less likely to transmit the virus to the person who is HIV negative. Um, so that has application to serodiscordant couples. Um, circumcision has also found to be, um, to provide partial protection for um, men in sexual encounters. We know that clean injection equipment can prevent um, the transmission of HIV uh, among drug users. And there's also post-exposure prophylaxis, also known as PEP. And this is uh, essentially taking the medication, Truvada, um, after a, a potential exposure, an actual exposure. So if someone were to have unprotected sex with someone who's HIV positive and they're concerned that they may then develop the virus, if they um, go and get medication within 72 hours, the earlier the better, um, but it's been found that they'd be less likely to go on to develop HIV. And now we have PrEP to, to add to the arsenal. Um, so you can see there's a variety of options, no one perfect solution, um, but for that reason, um, a combination prevention approach is advocated. I want to mention some of the potential benefits um, that PrEP may offer over other prevention methods or when used in conjunction with other prevention methods, um, which is currently recommended. Um, so first, it empowers the receptive partner. Um, and by the receptive partner, I mean either the woman during heterosexual intercourse um, or the man who uh, is being penetrated during penile anal intercourse among two men. Um, so, for example, the receptive partner doesn't have to rely on the insertive partner, the um, other partner, to use a condom consistently and correctly. They don't have to negotiate. Um, and this, along those lines, um, this is a covert method of HIV prevention. Um, so whereas with other methods such as um, condoms, you know, both partners are aware that they're being used, both partners have to be on board with it, in theory, um, someone can use PrEP and the other person doesn't need to know about it. Um, and this could be particularly advantageous for people who want to use condoms but don't want to rock the boat in a relationship or could actually be in um, physical danger if they were to suggest using condoms in a relationship. Um, in addition, uh, this could potentially allow for conception and protection simultaneously in serodiscordant partners. Um, and 
what I mean by that is if a man is HIV positive and the woman is HIV negative and they would like to conceive, you know, condoms won't really allow for that. And so now, um, in theory, PrEP could enable the woman to become pregnant um, without uh, putting her at risk or putting her at reduced risk for HIV. Um, this is uh, still, we still need evidence to support this or um, more safety evidence, but this is kind of um, the potential that PrEP has. Um, also, it doesn't interrupt the heat of the moment. This is a common gripe with condoms. Um, the taking of PrEP doesn't have to occur during the sexual event. You don't have to stop in the middle of it. It can be, you know, earlier that day and it wouldn't interrupt. Um, other barriers to condom use or other complaints about condom use can also be avoided um, by PrEP. So it wouldn't necessarily serve as a barrier to pleasure um, or functioning or perceived intimacy. And all of these things have been reasons that people have cited for not using condoms. Um, also, it could protect against sexual and non-sexual HIV transmission simultaneously. So among people who both inject drugs um, and also engage in unprotected sex, um, this might offer dual protection. Okay, so now that I've outlined the benefits of PrEP, um, and I'll get into some of the risks or concerns in just a moment, um, but I want to talk about reactions to PrEP. So you might think, based on what I've described, uh, that PrEP is a miracle drug, you know, and some leaders in the HIV prevention and gay communities have spoken up in support of it. Um, for example, ACT UP was integral in encouraging the New York State Department of Health to release guidelines that would support providers' prescription, and that just came out a few days ago. Um, but I want to share some quotes that I think will illustrate some of the opinions uh, in the community. Uh, Chris Collins is the vice president of the American Foundation for AIDS Research, and he said, we need new tools to fight this epidemic. PrEP is certainly not for everyone, but it may have a role in bringing HIV infection rates down. Uh, Nick Litursky is a PrEP user and advocate in Seattle, and he has been very vocal about his own experience um, in an effort to spread awareness about PrEP. So, for, an ex for example, in an online article that he authored, he said, Before PrEP became available, I was taking a calculated risk with my partner. PrEP didn't make me stop using condoms. Instead, PrEP provided me with the protection that I would use consistently rather than protection I was already rejecting. Um, Brendan Schuchart is um, the editor at, lar at large for Positive Frontiers, which is an HIV magazine for um, gay and bisexual men. And he described his own experience as an HIV positive man who had fallen in love with um, an HIV negative man. And so um, during the course of their relationship, he had taken his medication rigorously, he had remained virally suppressed, and he and his boyfriend were pretty good about condom use. Um, but nonetheless, one day his boyfriend showed up with tears in his eyes and an HIV positive diagnosis. So Brendan went on to describe feeling toxic and guilty and very responsible. And for years after that, he just avoided any kind of a relationship with an HIV negative man. When he did then open the door to relationships with HIV negative men, he found that um, sexually he was having difficulty performing because of anxiety around transmission. So in an op-ed earlier this month, he said, for many of us living with HIV, that's what the FDA's approval of Truvada for use as PrEP means, hope. Hope that one day we can let our guard down, be less than perfectly vigilant, and love without fear. Thus, if PrEP does become established as safe and effective, um, in real world scenarios, it would not only bring benefits to the HIV negative community, um, but also to the HIV positive community. So despite these positive reactions to PrEP, there have also been, there's also been some opposition. Uh, so some community members feel like PrEP, or more specifically, the high risk population that it's targeted for, are a lost cause. For example, Dan Savage, who some of you may know from um, the Savage Love cast. He's a uh, well-known sex advice columnist, um, and he said the following when interviewed for the New York Times uh, just in June of this past year. The guys these sensible, care, these sensible healthcare folks are trying to reach um, by offering PrEP and PEP 
are not sensible. They are self-identified idiots who can only be saved by a vaccine. Uh, Michael Weinstein, he's the president of the AIDS Healthcare Foundation, um, and he's been a very vocal opponent of PrEP. Um, so the AIDS Healthcare Foundation is a California-based global nonprofit um, organization and advocacy group that provides HIV services to over 200,000 people. Um, so following the release of the results of the IPREX trial, Michael Weinstein wrote an opinion piece saying, the applause for this approach shows just how disposable we consider the lives of gay, man, gay men. He felt like the efficacy reports in clinical trials was insufficient, and he rallied against the FDA's approval of Truvada as PrEP. So now that I've given you a taste of some of the mixed reactions by community members, I want to get into the barriers to prescription among healthcare providers. Um, there have been quite a few reservations expressed among healthcare providers, and this has led to perceived difficulty in accessing PrEP by some members of the gay community. So in an article entitled, The Unexpected Struggle to Make Doctors Allies in PrEP, um, Jake Sobo said, if you asked me what I thought the biggest obstacles facing PrEP would be, it would not have immediately occurred to me to add doctors to the list. I would have expected doctors to be an easy sell. The reality is precisely the opposite of what I expected. Um, in a 2013 survey of um, 573 infectious disease docs throughout the US and Canada, it was found that the majority did in fact support PrEP, um, but only 9% had actually provided PrEP. And about a third believed uh, that PrEP was irrelevant to their practice. Um, and this last point stood out to me um, because of an experience that I had um, with a good friend who lives in Washington, D.C. and is um, an HIV prevention researcher himself, is very well informed about PrEP, and he's in a serodiscordant relationship and wanted to get on PrEP um, to, for the added layer of protection. He and his boyfriend use condoms, but he wanted to feel extra safe and have this option. Um, so he called me up one day incredibly frustrated because he was trying to get PrEP and couldn't get it. Despite the fact he had health insurance, when he went to his primary care physician, um, the doctor was unfamiliar with PrEP and referred him to an infectious disease doctor. Then he called up several different infectious disease doctors and they all refused to give him an appointment because he did not in fact have an infectious disease. Um, so he fortunately was able to get into a clinical trial and is now on PrEP and having a good experience with it. Um, but not everybody is as fortunate as he was to be living in a city where clinical trials are going on. Um, so you can see that many people may be facing this problem where um, they aren't able to get a prescription from their doctor even if they have um, the finances for it or even if they have insurance. Um, I think it's important to keep in mind that if providers aren't willing to prescribe PrEP, um, people may get it by other means. Um, you know, I've, I've heard of people going to the emergency room claiming to have had an exposure event, getting a prescription for PEP and using it as PrEP. That's one example. Um, there's also a street market for Truvada, um, which if people are desperate and want to be on PrEP, they may turn to that. And if they're forced to go this route, think about how much less safe PrEP will be um, without the consistent monitoring, without the consistent HIV testing, and the adherence counseling and so on. Okay, so um, before I get into the uh, provider's views, I want to just give you a basic rundown on the prescription, guide, prescription guidance that's been put out by the CDC. Um, so before starting a patient on PrEP, a doctor should confirm that the, the patient is HIV negative, confirm that he or she is at ongoing very high risk for acquiring HIV infection. Um, unfortunately, the CDC um, doesn't provide many examples of what this means. And as a result, it's pretty subject to interpretation. Um, and I'll get into the, why that might be a problem uh, when I discuss my own research. So when writing a prescription, no more than a 90-day supply should be prescribed. And the patient should, co should come in for regular follow-up visits every two to three months, at which point he or she should be tested for HIV, other STIs, and pregnancy. Um, the provider should also evaluate the patient's level of adherence, offer support around adherence, and the provider should be asking about the patient's behavior um, and assess the patient's level of risk. 
and if appropriate, the provider should then offer risk reduction counseling and condoms. So now let's get into some of the concerns that providers have expressed. And um, these are also the bases of opposition among some community members. A big one that we hear again and again is sexual risk compensation. So sexual risk compensation refers to an increase in sexual risk taking behavior due to a perceived decrease in susceptibility to HIV acquisition. So um, the concern is if a man is prescribed PrEP, he will then um, go out and have more unprotected sex or increase his number of partners and essentially um, the PrEP prescription will do more harm than good. Uh, so far there has not been substantial evidence for risk compensation occurring in PrEP. Um, in fact, several trials have reported decreases in risk behavior across the duration of the study. Um, that being said, our evidence comes from clinical trials or open label extensions thereof and therefore um, they're not representative of the real world. So in other words, people who are in the clinical trials, they don't know if they're um, on the placebo or on PrEP, and especially in the early um, trials, they were unaware of any efficacy of PrEP. So they would probably be less likely to increase their risk behavior because they might not have that perceived decrease in susceptibility. Um, so what we know so far is based on people who have been in clinical trials and um, within the clinical trials have gotten very comprehensive HIV prevention services, um, which although may be recommended for real world um, implementation as well. In reality, um, people may not have access to that comprehensive of a prevention package. So therefore, these individuals are not representative of real world individuals. Um, so we don't yet know really what risk compensation is going to look like um, once um, PrEP is out there in the real world. We're still waiting on effectiveness data. Um, another concern is that um, patients will acquire other STIs. So along the same lines, if they start using PrEP and reduce their condom use, um, they may be putting themselves at risk um, for STIs other than HIV. Um, adherence is also a big concern. Um, so there's concern that people will be inconsistent about adherence and then, you know, susceptible to HIV. But in addition, there's this added issue of viral resistance in that um, because the medication that's used for PrEP is also the same medication used to treat HIV, there's concern that individuals um, will acquire HIV, maybe sort of inconsistently adherent, acquire HIV without knowing it, and then continue to be sort of inconsistently adherent and in the process develop drug resistance um, or um, resistance to, uh, the virus would be resistant to the medication. Um, there's also concern that they may be more likely to select for um, they may be more likely to acquire drug resistant strains, although there hasn't been evidence of this. Um, in terms of the data so far, um, resistance has been extremely rare. Um, there have been some developments of viral resistance, but I think altogether it was about five people across all four trials that I covered. Okay, um, another issue that comes up is cost and reimbursement. and so far, fingers crossed, um, most insurance companies and state Medicaid programs have been covering PrEP. Um, and also Gilead has a medication assistance program for those people who um, are low income. They will provide PrEP for free. So um, hopefully cost won't be too much interference in um, writing these prescriptions. Um, another big one is drug toxicity and side effects. And, you know, doctors feel like, why would we pres be prescribing these medications that could cause side effects to perfectly healthy individuals, especially if there are other means of prevention? Um, I mean, the argument is that there are other medications that are prescribed to healthy individuals for preventive reasons that do have side effects. Um, but beyond that, um, the side effects have been pretty minimal for um, Truvada is PrEP. So um, there's been basically a comparable level of serious adverse events between placebo groups and uh, treatment groups within clinical trials. Um, the primary side effect that is seen with Truvada is um, GI issues such as nausea. Um, however, that's seen in a minority. It's um, usually just for the first month or so. 
and dissipates. Um, so it is pretty mild. Um, there's also been reported a 1% reduction in bone mineral density, um, and there's concern about renal complications, although renal complications haven't been um, highly supported by the clinical trials. I think that concern comes more from um, looking at Truvada within people who are HIV positive. Okay. Um, so safety and efficacy and lack of real world evidence are another concern. You know, right now <clears throat> we have the clinical trial evidence that I presented, but right now we don't really know what it's going to look like in the real world, and so this is a concern for providers. Um, they're also um, unwilling to prescribe because of a lack of personal knowledge. Um, bless you. Um, and so I think that, you know, it's up to a provider to be knowledgeable about the prevention options that are out there, but also for those of us who are in public health, I think we have a role in educating providers about PrEP um, in order to increase their knowledge. Um, resources have also come up, and so in a, this could be in a couple of different ways. So some providers feel like they simply don't have the um, time personally to be monitoring these patients so closely and sitting down and having these adherence counseling or risk counseling sessions, or they wouldn't have the, the staff to do it. Um, and also resources have been expressed as a concern in terms of um, resource allocation. Um, so using a particular medication for preventative versus treatment purposes if there's a limited supply and resource limited senate, uh, settings. Um, and finally, um, there's also concerns about need. So some providers simply feel like there are other alternatives, good alternatives that work. Um, there's no need for PrEP. Um, and also there's debate around risk level, um, you know, at what level of risk should a person really be prescribed PrEP. So now I'd like to turn to some of my recent research. Um, so what I'll be presenting today is a pilot study that I conducted with uh, my colleagues here at Yale um, entitled The Impact of Patient Race on Clinical Decisions Related to Prescribing HIV Pre-Exposure Prophylaxis, Assumptions About Sexual Risk Compensation, and Implications for Access. Um, so first it's important, I think, just to kind of set the stage for this work, to note the social disparities in HIV prevalence. Um, racial and sexual minority groups continue to be disproportionately affected. So black men represent less than 14% of the U.S. male population, and yet they account for 38% of um, U.S. men living with HIV. Um, we know that black MSM in particular um, bear the brunt of the burden among black men. So even though black MSM account for probably two to five percent of the black male population, they account for almost three quarters of all newly acquired HIV infections. Um, we know that establishing effective and accessible HIV prevention strategies for communities of high prevalence is a national health priority. Um, therefore, it's important to look at PrEP and the potential benefit that it might offer to um, some of these minority communities um, where there is a high prevalence of HIV. So while PrEP is indeed an exciting new strategy for HIV prevention, um, the real world effectiveness of it will depend critically upon provider uptake and appropriate implementation within clinical practice. And um, for multiple reasons, PrEP might be especially vulnerable to discriminatory prescription practices. First, there's documentation of racial disparities in uh, patient diagnosis and treatment across medical conditions. So this is pervasive throughout healthcare. And HIV care is no exception. So multiple studies have shown that black patients experience longer delays to receiving antiretroviral medication when in care. Um, this could be foretelling of race-based differences in receipt of antiretroviral medication for preventive purposes, in other words, PrEP. We also know that greater reliance on provider discretion as opposed to clear clinical criteria increases the risk of discrimination occurring. Um, so research has shown that racial discrimination is more likely in contexts in which um, behavioral norms or situational demands are ambiguous and that this applies to medical settings. 
Um, so as mentioned previously, right now, um, clear eligible criteria, clear elig eligibility criteria are lacking. Um, so the CDC has put out this um, guidance, but it's labeled interim guidance as they work on more comprehensive um, guidelines for providers. And so right now, um, you know, they, they say that someone needs to be at very high risk. Um, they offer an example or two, but they don't really give specifics. Um, the maker of the medication itself, um, Gilead, um, as well as um, some other sources have tried to offer more specifics, but for the most part, um, who is eligible and who is not and who qualifies is really dependent on the provider's discretion. And we know that provider opinions about hypothetical cases and standards are conflicting. So there has been research that has presented providers with these different cases and we, we indeed see that there's controversy, controversy among them. Um, so, as mentioned previously, one concern that's been repeatedly expressed as a deterrent to prescribing PrEP is sexual risk compensation. Um, to date, there's um, really no substantial evidence for sexual risk compensation with PrEP. Um, there's no evidence for racial disparities in sexual risk compensation. So, um, there's no reason to believe that um, a black man or a black um, gay or bisexual man would engage in more sexual risk than um, a white man or a white man who has sex with men. Um, nonetheless, we know that there are these sexual stereotypes out there of black men and um, black MSM in particular as being sexually risky and out of control. Um, importantly, there's no empirical basis for this, um, not just in terms of prep research, but also, um, you know, if you look at sexual risk taking in general in the MSM community. We know that black MSM um, do not engage in more risk behavior than their other race counterparts. In fact, in many ways, they're a bit better about condom use, or so less risky than other racial groups. Nonetheless, because we do know that there are these stereotypes, um, it's possible that the stereotypes could influence clinical judgment. Okay, so um, I have it, within my program of research, I have several overarching research goals. So uh, first, based on this background I gave you, I want to identify disparities in clinical judgments about PrEP based on patient race, as well as other patient characteristics. So things like sexual orientation and gender, um, the potential risk behavior, whether it's sexual or drug use, and so on. Um, and I want to look at how these different factors affect predictions about sexual risk compensation among providers, as well as providers' willingness to prescribe PrEP. Um, the goal of this research um, beyond that is to understand the psychological mechanisms that underlie disparities in judgment in order to um, address the disparities through provider-targeted educational interventions. Um, so today what I'll be focusing on is the pilot study, um, which addresses the first goal. Um, the latter two goals are part of a planned program of research um, that I've mapped out over the next few years. So um, in the pilot study that I'll be presenting, my colleagues and I chose to look at medical students in particular as healthcare providers. Um, because they are providers in training, they in theory have many years of um, service ahead of them, um, and um, we, we thought that they may be more likely to draw on their formal medical education as opposed to clinic background clinical experience. So my colleagues and I approached this study with two objectives in mind. Um, first, to examine the predictions about sexual risk compensation for a um, black man who has sex with men as opposed to a white man who has sex with men. and. Um, in, in particular, we're gonna, we wanted to look at it in the context of um, a primary care scenario where the person was actually seeking out PrEP. We also wanted to test the indirect effect of patient race on PrEP prescription willingness through sexual risk compensation. So specifically, we hypothesized that the black patient would be judged as more likely to increase um, his sexual risk taking if prescribed PrEP, and that this in turn would lead to a reduced willingness to prescribe PrEP to the patient. 
Okay, so we tested these objectives uh, using an online survey in which participants were presented with a vignette describing um, a patient who is seeking PrEP um, in a primary care scenario, and then they were asked to make clinical decisions about that patient. So patient race was systematically manipulated such that participants were randomized to one of two conditions um, describing either a black patient or a white patient um, asking for PrEP in this medical scenario. Um, so an initial and follow-up email request for participation in an on anonymous online survey about attitudes towards prescribing PrEP was distributed to the Yale Medical Student Listserv. Um, our final sample was comprised of 102 medical students. So the survey itself consisted of four parts. Um, first, participants were provided with background information about Truvada, including its purpose, uh, partial efficacy, according to the three clinical trials that had taken place up until then, and its approval by the FDA. Uh, second, they were presented with quotes representing popular arguments for and um, against the prescription of PrEP. Then the clinical vignette itself was displayed, which I'll show you in just a moment. And finally, participants were asked to make a series of clinical judgments pertaining to the vignette and to respond to other survey items. So here's the vignette that the uh, participants were shown. I've highlighted key, purpose, or key pieces of information just for the purpose of this talk. So the vignette read as follows. Uh, Mr. J is a 31-year-old uh, black man who is HIV negative. He presents to you his primary care physician stating that he wants to take the medication to help prevent himself from getting HIV. He has insurance that would cover the prescription. Mr. J currently has one male sex partner who has been diagnosed as HIV positive and with whom he is monogamous. During previous appointments, you have, discuss you have discussed HIV risk with him and encouraged him to use condoms. However, he does not always use them, resulting in repeated episodes of unprotected sex with his partner. Um, HIV antibody and RNA lab tests confirm that Mr. J is HIV negative. He's never had any STDs. He has no physical complaints. He's never had surgery or been hospitalized. His medical history is otherwise unremarkable. Um, Mr. J does not use alcohol, tobacco, or other drugs. He has no known drug allergies and is not currently taking any medication. So after participants um, were shown that vignette, uh, they were asked a series of questions. Um, they were asked about predicted sexual risk compensation. So specifically, we asked how likely would this patient be to have more unprotected sex if he started taking Truvada as PrEP. We asked about PrEP prescription willingness, specifically asking would you prescribe Truvada as PrEP to this patient? And we also asked about other clinical judgments, things like predicted adherence, um, risk of the patient's risk of HIV infection if they were not to prescribe PrEP, um, the risk reduction that they associated with PrEP. Um, we asked about racial bias as well, um, which we conceptualized as perceived importance of the patient's request, as well as general feelings towards black patients versus white patients. And finally, we asked about background characteristics, including both sociodemographics as well as medical training characteristics. Um, so univariate analyses of covariance controlling for participant race were used to compare clinical judgments between patient race conditions. Um, we used hierarchical linear regression in order to um, look at predictors of prescription willingness. And finally, we tested for the indirect effect um, that I showed you in the diagram earlier using bootstrapping. Mm. So moving on to the results. In terms of sample characteristics, um, participants were evenly split by gender. Um, the two largest racial groups represented were white and Asian. There were very few Latinas, blacks, or people of other races. Uh, the majority of participants identified as heterosexual, and students from all years of medical school were represented. Um, notably, none of these characteristics differed significantly across uh, conditions. So our first goal was to um, examine the effect of patient race on predictions about sexual risk compensation. 
So this table here displays uh, means comparisons between conditions in terms of clinical judgments of the black patient, which is condition one, versus clinical judgments of the white patient, which is condition two. As you can see along the left column, these are the different, different um, clinical judgments that were examined. And by looking at the p-values, you can see that the one that emerged as significantly different was patient sexual risk compensation. Um, so you can see that the black patient was judged as more likely to engage in sexual risk compensation than the white patient. Next, we sought to examine the effect of predicted sexual risk compensation on willingness to prescribe PrEP, uh, controlling for patient race. Uh, so this table shows results from our, higher, our hierarchical linear regression. The independent variables are listed in the left column, and the lines represent the uh, three different sets of variables um, that were entered. I want to draw your attention to the variable at the bottom, which is predicted patient sexual risk compensation, which was added by itself in the third and final um, step. I'll blow this up for you. Um, so you can see that um, predicted patient sexual risk compensation um, was highly significantly related to prescription willingness. Um, overall, our model accounted for 32% of the variance in willingness to prescribe PrEP. And the addition of that one variable to the model accounted for an additional 11% of the variance. So finally, we sought to test the entire model, testing the indirect effect of patient race on PrEP prescription willingness through predicted sexual risk compensation. Uh, we used bootstrapping to calculate a bias corrected and accelerated 95% confidence interval of the indirect effect. And as can be seen, a significant indirect effect emerged um, as indicated by a confidence interval that did not straddle zero. So turning to the model, you can see the unstandardized coefficients and standard errors uh, for all of the paths. And um, to summarize, these uh, results indicated that the black patient was judged as more likely to engage in sexual risk compensation, which in turn was related to reduced prescription willingness. So in summary, um, the black patient was judged as more likely to engage in sexual risk compensation than the white patient. Um, and keep in mind in this particular scenario, the hypothetical patient was kind of a straight edge, you know, he was kind of a goody two-shoes. He didn't drink, he didn't smoke or do drugs, and importantly, he was monogamous. Some might say he was the ideal candidate for PrEP, and yet despite the fact that he did not fit the black male stereotype of being sexually out of control or hypersexual by description, we still found this difference. Um, we also found that predicted patient sexual risk compensation was strongly associate, associated with PrEP prescription willingness. Um, over and above sociodemographic and medical training characteristics, racial bias, and other forms of clinical judgment. Patient race was indirectly related to prescription willingness, such that the black patient uh, was judged as more likely to engage in sexual risk, and this was linked to reduced willingness to prescribe. Okay, so in terms of future research, some of which I alluded to in sharing my research goals, um, I think it's important to look at other healthcare provider samples. I think it's very interesting um, to focus on the medical student community, but we also want to know what biases exist among people who are actively prescribing um, and actively practicing presently. Um, also, we want to look beyond just, um, we want to look in other clinical settings. If ideally PrEP is going to be implemented across a broad spectrum of clinical settings, we want to find out what biases and discriminatory practices might occur in those settings and to look um, throughout, uh, throughout the country. I'm also interested in looking at moderators. Um, things like provider characteristics, in particular provider race. It's been shown previously that provider race and the concordance between provider race and patient race is related to decisions around HIV treatment. So I think it's interesting to look at that in the future. Unfortunately, we just didn't have the numbers to look at it with this sample. Also, I want to look at other patient characteristics, including gender and sexual orientation, 
um, and risk behavior. I also want to explore psychological mechanisms. So looking at the implicit or, and or explicit biases and prejudice that might be underlying these clinical decisions. And finally, it's important to look at this in real world prescription behavior. Um, right now, this is just within the context of a clinical vignette. We want to see if this is actually happening as PrEP is rolled out. This research has implications for future intervention as well. Uh, first, it speaks to um, the potential or the need to increase awareness about PrEP among providers and to prevent stereotypes from adversely affecting clinical judgment. Um, there are several different um, approaches to doing this that have been put forward in the field of social cognitive psychology, including things like emphasizing individuation or focusing on individual characteristics as opposed to social categorization or group membership. Um, also building a sense of partnership between the patient and the provider and informing providers about their own vulnerability to stereotyping and discrimination. So PrEP is a promising prevention strategy. Hopefully I've convinced you of that. Um, I think it has great potential to impact the HIV epidemic. Um, but whether you're on board with it or not at this point, I think we can all agree that if it is going to be prescribed, it should be prescribed fairly. And people across the social spectrum should have equal access to it. Um, therefore, stereotypes and biases should not be allowed to become bases for denying access. Uh, Black MSM, which is the gro group that I focused on in my research, they comprise one of many different socially marginalized groups who stand to benefit from PrEP. Um, other social groups who are considered to be at heightened risk based on um, their sociodemographic characteristics or their behavioral practices, so groups like transgender individuals or sex workers, they also might confront healthcare bias that interferes with access to PrEP. So it's important to consider other groups as well. Um, so far in hearing about um, kind of barriers to equitable access, most of what I've heard about is things like cost and resource allocation, but we really need to consider other factors as well, not just structural. Um, I think it's essential that we start having honest conversations about race. Um, and how race and how stereotypes play into clinical decision making. Um, in presenting this work, my purpose is not to, or my intention is not to name call or point fingers at healthcare providers. Um, most are very well intentioned, who are just uh, individuals who are just trying to maximize the health of their patients. Um, however, like it or not, healthcare providers and everyone else in this room are members of a society where stereotypes still exist and stereotypes influence behavior, and sometimes unconsciously. Uh, therefore, we can't ignore the potential influence of stereotypes on treatment in the healthcare system and related to PrEP specifically. Uh, what I also want to drive home is that timing is critical for increasing awareness about stereotypes and their potential impact on PrEP-related clinical judgments. Um, right now is when uh, PrEP is being introduced to healthcare settings across the country. Right now is when the CDC is putting together these more comprehensive guidelines. So I think it could be valuable to integrate some of this material um, into these introductions and into these guidelines. Um, finally, I want to acknowledge my co-authors, some of whom are in the room, um, as well as the um, Yale University Interdisciplinary HIV Prevention Training Program, the T32 program, of which I'm a part. Um, Sierra, uh, Dr. Jamie Meyer, who's in the audience, uh, and helped us to refine our clinical vignette. Uh, Dr. Nancy Ingoff, who helped with recruitment, and the New Haven restaurant owners who uh, donated gift certificates to serve as um, participant incentives. Finally, I want to thank the medical student participants um, who made this research happen. Um, I also want to put in a quick plug uh, for those of you who are interested in discussion and debate and or research on the topic of PrEP, um, Dr. Margaret Weeks is uh, forming a uh, PrEP interest group and um, you are welcome to contact her. 
at this address, or if you want to reach out to me, I will put you in touch with her.